we actually we have several questions, but they all center on this issue. How can we teach history in ways that engage students and make history relevant? How can we use tools that allow young people to think critically, problem solve, and develop the ability to think historically about both the past and the present? And must we cover everything on the list? So it's my really great pleasure to introduce our three panelists. Um, first, we'll hear from JoLynn Merchant. She's been teaching for 17 years. She currently teaches Utah and US history and serves as a mentor leader teacher at Thomas, Ed Ed Thomas Edison Charter Schools in Cache Valley. Most of her career has been spent working with middle school students. She adores teenagers and she loves to help them understand how to get their teenage brains to work properly. It's a rare soul who loves to work with teenagers that age. Um, jo was named Utah History Teacher of the Year. She was the Patricia Baring National History Day Teacher of the Year for Utah and was an NHD Teacher Ambassador. And her seventh and eighth grade students successfully compete year after year at the regional, state, and national levels of the NHD competition. Currently, Joe's working on her master's degree in American history. She also maintains a business with her husband working as artisan scholars and living history educators. Teaching gives Jo incredible joy. One of her favorite things is watching the light switch on for her students as they gain a true love of history and understand how they can apply historical lessons to their personal lives. Our second presenter is Quinn Rollins. He's a history teacher, an author, a toy maker, and according to his website, he's also a Lego builder, a comic book reader, a doodler in meetings, and an obsessive compulsive geek. Before becoming a teacher, Quinn spent, I believe, about 10 years as a professional toy maker. And more recently, he's traveled the world lecturing and signing his five-star book, Play Like a Pirate, Engage Students with Toys, Games, and Comics. And he currently teaches at Cypress High School in Magna. And our third presenter is Dr. Hayden Call. He has over a decade of experience as an educator. He's taught social studies and history classes at Utah State University, Weber State University, Beaumont High School, and Mill Creek Junior High. He has a PhD in education, an MA in history, an MED in curriculum and instruction, and a bachelor's in history. Um, Hayden has presented at state, national, international history and social studies conferences, and he's published articles in local journals as well as national journals. He is currently an assistant principal at Mueller Park Junior High School in Davis School District. So I'm gonna turn the time over to Jo first, and while she gets set up, I'm gonna hand out um, some literature for you. Is this on? No? Yeah? Okay, cool. Um, we have, uh, <laughs> pretty fun being a teacher of seventh grade, right? Eighth grade is pretty awesome. But one of the things that I have in my class is that I have a 10 to one rule. A 10 to 1 rule is where you basically, if you're talking for 10 minutes, you got to get up and do something else. So, or you got to change up the pace of the class. So I know that normally these conferences are like really, you just kind of sit and listen. But I'm going to ask that you do something for me. There, if you have a piece of paper, just any blank piece of paper, um, or if you would like, I have something that you can write on the back of. Um, but you, I would like you to think of an, uh, just any kind of um, presentation that you've heard today. And this is one of the things that we do in our class called a gallery walk. And a gallery walk is where you uh, draw about things that you learn. And so just for a minute, just take any piece of paper if you have one. If you don't, you can borrow one. Uh, hopefully everybody has something to write with. And I want you to draw just anything you can think of that we have talked about today. Oh. Draw anything you can think of that you've learned about today. It could be on any of the presentations, anything that you heard, um, learned about, thought that was important. And it just needs to be a quick doodle.
course, meanwhile, you're walking around. The kid has the blank look on their face going, I don't know what I've learned. And you can help them kind of get on to a few key words. They won't let you have a pencil. They won't let you have a pencil? Too short. Too short. Oh, Wrong no. <laughs> Of course, you always have a cup on the counter, right? There's one right there. Go grab one. Okay. Um, hopefully, you got something drawn, a little bit of it. And um, if not, um, that's okay. Just go ahead. And what we're going to do is have you put your uh, picture that you drew on the chair at the end of the aisle. Everybody's going to get up, and we're going to walk down and go, oh, and look at all the pictures. That's called a gallery walk. You're going to look at it, and while you're looking at those pictures, you do a walk and talk. Walk and talk. So the walk and talk is, oh, I noticed that. I remembered what that one is, right? And you can talk about what you learned today um, while you are walking and talking. So everybody put your pictures at the end of the rows. Oh, come on, you guys. <laughs> Teaching from the trenches here. Adults are the worst. I know, <laughs> they are. <laughs> Why do you think I work with seventh graders? <laughs> 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 uh, right, so you look at these pictures and you go, okay, I remember some of these. I didn't get to see that one. That was cool. When you talk, oh, yes, I did see that one. I know that one. Oh, right. I know. I joke about that all the time. We're like, 
about basing it in text or basing it, I mean, the, one of the real issues with something like this is it can get real personal really fast. Oh, yeah. And it can be really, it can be really just even destructive in a classroom environment instead oh, of, definitely. instead yeah. of like this, so your question was constitutionally, 
Right. And that's the caveat that for me says, yes, regardless of where I might personally stand, this is the text, this is the high crimes and misdemeanors language, this is where I stand. Right, and that is very important. And also I do, um, before I do anything like this, I set up the structure in my classroom so it's a safe environment where they can feel safe with expressing their opinion. Also, I do try, <laughs> since we're all adults, I figured this would be a really good one that we could do. But since uh, in class, I very seldom bring up the politics word. like this. It's modern day politics. <laughs> the T word? Oh, the Trump word? <laughs> 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 okay, so anyway, so real quick, let's just try it out. Anybody want to offer a comment over on this side? Since this is the biggest group. No one's brave enough. Well, I, oh, I'm going okay. along with what he said. I I feel the same way. I mean, if we if we get the amount of people in the House and the Senate to impeach him, you can impeach any president constitutionally. So that's kind of why I'm here. Not maybe necessarily um, be, because I think he will be, or that maybe he should should be or should not have been. But I think he can. Because okay. of the vagueness of the constitutional yeah. language, <laughs> high crimes and misdemeanors. I was here now whether. He will. I would be oh, over there. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> but and again, the phrase is different than removed. Right. Yeah. So I mean, okay. to be impeached mm -hmm. given the House of Representatives mm -hmm. numbers, but based on the Senate, he won't be. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, how about you guys? How do you feel? Well, if you can't impeach Bill Clinton for lying before a federally appointed grand jury, <laughs> if that's not a high crime or misdemeanor, I don't see where. Well, they did impeach him, but they didn't convict. And so, yeah. well, that wasn't the question. Yeah. But the question is, constitutionally, uh, yeah. can he be impeached? Yeah. And you're saying, constitutionally. Well, well what I'm yes. saying is, uh, because of executive privilege and that sort of thing, uh, he probably wouldn't be convicted. But actually, based on what they say, and could he be impeached? I'm going to change sides because I think he could absolutely be impeached. He's just not going to. Right. <laughs> See, and, I, and I love that you said you want to switch sides because kids will. They'll switch sides after other people start talking and you're like, and they're like, yeah. And you'll have kids that will go from side to side to side because they're like, oh, oh, oh. And then they end up in the middle because they're like, I don't know where to go. <laughs> so, but it's a really great way to discuss and you hope that, that you can really make sure that it stays a safe environment though. That's really key on this one. Yeah. Well, what I kind of think is, you know, pushing, everything is instantaneous now. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like a hundred years ago where you had to send some me a write, post writer out to get the information <laughs> out to everybody. I mean, everything's instantaneous now, and I think a lot of people are jumping the gun, you know, saying things maybe inappropriate, maybe not, but you know, and then you also have a president who says what he thinks. <laughs> this is so true. Time. <laughs> and so, and so he's over there saying what he thinks, and he doesn't think. I don't know how far he deep, deep, deep down he thinks about it, and then people respond to it when they hear about it, and they go, "Well, yay or nay." But I mean, I think in order, it's like those hearings they had a while back. Uh, you know, you have to. I think you'd have to have a total hearing, on both sides, and then actually look at the document and say. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is what is impeachable, and this is not impeachable. Yeah. Because there's a there's a definite criteria with that, you know, how he's to be impeached, or anybody gets impeached as a president. I mean, there's probably a strict, you know, <laughs> a standard <laughs> language that everybody has to abide by. Yep. <laughs> so. Who <laughs> knows? Okay. So. Well, I love, can I just say? Yeah. 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 I, I think the really critical piece here would be that there's also this is where content and skill. An opinion fit together with text, because definitely. language would be really important for this. So yes, so definitely. Yeah, yeah, Thanks. definitely. Okay, um, let's see. There, oh, okay, there's this other list that you got. There's a whole bunch of hook ideas on both sides. You guys, I mean, one of my most favorite books is Teach Like a Pirate, and the follow up favorite book. Is Play Like a Pirate, which is his. <laughs> but the Teach Like a Pirate, there's a whole bunch of books here that have lots of ideas. And the key to with you guys, when you're teaching the kids, even even if it's professors at a university, I mean, 
they, they need to love it in order to learn it. And in order to, you know, they, in order to love it, they got to have something that in, they enjoy, that the class is enjoyable, and, then it's, and if they enjoy the class, they'll love the content. So they got to love it first, and then the content comes after. So, okay. So, um, first of all, yes, everything that Joe said, because it's all good and true and correct, and you should all be doing that stuff, because, yeah. Um, I, I taught seventh grade for 10 years, and then I sold my soul to the school district, and I did school district office stuff for like six years, and then I went back to the classroom, now I'm teaching high school. So spent a lot of time teaching in middle school and loving it. Now I'm teaching high school and loving it. Um, I, uh, w one of the first things I want to uh, talk about is this book. No, not really. But um, the cover, it's like a butterfly's eyelid, you guys. It's so, like you want, Ten copies. Of, anyway, okay. So um, this book is as practical as I can possibly make it. Okay, it is uh, like if I was telling the teacher next to me, "This is what I do in my class this day." That's the that's how the book is written. Okay, and uh, including made up words that I made up and my editor left in. So good for her. Uh, two resources that um, I uh, that I use in my presentations all the time. They give you some insight into what I do in my classroom. One of them is the website quinnrollins.com. So on your paper, you can just put a .com after my name. But it has a lot of free templates. It has resources. It has like lists of graphic novels I recommend. It has ongoing graphic novel reviews. It has ideas I had that aren't in the book. It has samples of student work. It has um, kind of everything that you would need. Like technically, you don't have to buy this. But like my publisher says, don't say that part. So I won't. Um, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, butterfly, <laughs> butterfly. Yeah. Anyway, I'll stop. Um, and the other, the other one is uh, on Instagram. If you're an Instagrammy kind of person, um, my classroom account is Rollins underscore Cypress, C Y P R U S, and that is um, I, I share what my students are doing. I share what I'm doing. Uh, I have four U.S. history classes with 11th graders. I have two history through film classes, and I have uh, I also teach AVID, which is kind of a college prep thing that's hit or miss. Um, so three things I want to talk about. Uh, the first one is text sets and the idea of text sets. Those of you who are in the classroom, uh, any of you use text sets already or know what they are even? Sometimes, all right, good. So, several of you do, and by several, I mean three because that's how big this crowd is. So, three counts as several. Good job, thank you for being here. Um, so, a text set uh, is a set for me, it's five or six or seven documents that are all about a single topic. So, uh, when we uh, are talking about a current event, we're looking at homelessness. Um, I have a Pat Bagley cartoon alongside a poem, alongside a map of homelessness in the United States, um, a graph, uh, a Salt Lake Tribune article about the uh, Rio Grande area operation, um, and students choose from those, uh, like of the six, they need to choose four of those things they're going to use to analyze the topic. And what that does is it gives them student choice or the illusion of student choice, which gives them buy-in because they're like, I don't want to look at a political cartoon today, so I want to do these other things instead. They're still getting the content. They're still working with the content I want them to be working with and studying. So if it is a, a subject where there's a lot of content to cover, which is every history topic, um, and there are too many primary sources for you to use, and they're all wonderful, and you don't want to drop any, then don't drop some. Like, include them and let students pick and choose. Um, I don't do this until after we've already, like, I wouldn't put a political cartoon in a text set until we've analyzed political cartoons as a class. So, 
they know the skills they're supposed to be using with those particular kinds of documents, and then uh, they, it's more an independent practice uh, part of the class. So um, I do with things that I think are personally fascinating and students might not find as fascinating. So things like the Dust Bowl, which next to influenza is the like sexiest topic of the 20th century. Um, <laughs> And, and so I, uh, I have an array of resources there and they get to pick and choose. Um, and also, uh, another thing that uh, Joe brought up is the uh, making a connection to today and or to the students' lives. And so for the Dust Bowl, I connect that to like human interactions with the environment, uh, climate change, things like that. And so there will be like 2019 articles alongside historic 1920s, 1930s um, information. And they can choose to delve into that or they can leave it to the side. Uh, in a wrap up classroom discussion, we're going to talk about that part anyway. So they're going to get some of it whether they want to or not, which is how I roll. Uh, with that connection to students' lives, um, I think it's very important uh, we're right now, this like last week and this week, we're looking at the Gilded Age and we're looking at robber barons versus um, captains of industry. And so as we've been looking at Carnegie and Vanderbilt and those people, we've also been looking at Jeff Bezos and Amazon and watching YouTube videos like how much money does he make per second? Answer, about $3,180 per second. Yeah. I, I don't know. You copy his look. You copy, yeah. Um, he uh, so so then we can have that discussion um, about income inequality in a way that they might understand it better than uh, looking at Rockefeller. And you can have them see, you know, if if you're a person who's a fan of Jeff Jeff Bezos, because a lot of my students are. They love him. They love Elon Musk. They love these people who have a lot of money and are doing cool things. Um, while my kids are like looking at working in an Amazon warehouse for $15 an hour, which sounds good to them. So we also watch videos about where their iPhones come from, and we watch videos about those Amazon warehouses, and then we look at child labor, and we're about to get into labor unions, and, and how these factory conditions that we look back on and are shocked at, and we think were terrible um, 130 years ago, are still happening, but a lot of it's happening in China and Bangladesh and Vietnam and countries, um, and like West Jordan, where the new Amazon warehouse is being built. <laughs> wow, with the microphone, like you hear everything I say, even like the under my breath stuff that you, know, you say about a student when you turn around, you're like on the whiteboard. Um, not that I would do that, because I'm responsible. The, the other way I try to connect it to student lives is, um, I do teach a U.S. history class, but I love Utah history and I love local history. And so, um, when I am when I talk about the Homestead Act, um, I plotted out 160 acres on Google Maps using Cypress High School as the center, because they don't know what an acre is. Why would they live in an apartment? So, so we uh, plotted out 160 acres and put it up there and said, "Hey." You know, you have five years to turn this into a workable farm with the resources that you have. Okay, you're a kid in 2019. Could you do this? Um, because that's a situation you might be in if you're coming from Boston or London or someplace. Okay, you're essentially dropped in and told, be a farmer, turn this into into a workable farm, and uh, and, and they they relate to that more. So when we do get to World War One, I'm going to be using some excerpts from books and stories uh, that happened here in Utah uh, to make them realize they do have a part in that story. And that includes um, small picture things like Magna, it includes uh, things that might be connected to their families, it includes uh, things like that. Uh, the last thing, and the thing that is, is most in this book is using pop culture to teach. and. Uh, uh, that includes things, so I, I did work as a toy designer. Uh, I designed action figures for a company called Palisades Toys, and we made toys based on the Muppets and Buffy the Vampire Slayer and the X-Files. Coolest, nerdiest job ever, next to being a history teacher, which is also a cool and nerdy job. <laughs> so, um, 
Uh, about 10 years ago, I was like, you know, I have these, uh, this other skill set, I have these other passions, why can't I bring that into the classroom? So I did bring it into the classroom, and it worked. So I have my kids design action figures. Uh, we're gonna be doing it based on the reform era people um, in the next month or so. Uh, I have them design Funko Pop characters. So those are, I like those little stylized action figures, and that'll be uh, in my Cold War unit. Uh, we did a Lego assembly line earlier this week. And with all of these things, I'm a big believer in the 10 to 1 rule, even though I've been talking for like 11 minutes. Um, <laughs> But in, within a single class period, within a 90 minute class period, we do at least five different things every day. Um, if I am standing and talking at them for 90 minutes, um, anybody know who the history professor in Harry Potter is? Professor Binns. Professor Binns, wow, nerd, good job. Um, <laughs> he, he, he is not in the books very much because only Hermione likes his class. And he is a ghost. Okay, he died in the middle of his own lecture. Um, or his it, yeah, so, so he, I mean, that's my life goal, actually, or death goal, I guess. But he, uh, yeah, we history teachers, we like to hear ourselves talk. And so uh, getting some of that into the kids, um, our Lego assembly line took 20 minutes of class. Okay? We talked about stuff before, we did some stuff with it afterwards but the Lego hands-on fun part of it was only like 20 minutes. Um, it's not going to be my whole class. Um, on my website, uh, quinnrollins.com, uh, I, I had them do um, NBA City jerseys. So uh, like the Jazz got these new awesome um, jerseys and, and so did other teams. And so I had them do that for New Deal programs because again, sexy topic, but these kids who would not do some other kind of New Deal activity were willing to do research on the TVA and on the CCC and then design these awesome like basketball uniforms to go with it. WPA um, all the way. Yeah, I mean, the, the TVA was the most popular because you got like lightning bolts and stuff. It was pretty sweet. Um, last thing I'll talk about is graphic novels just really fast. Um, if you teach US history, there is a series called Nathan Hale's Hazardous Tales, and uh, it's by a local author. He's uh, in Utah County. His name's Nathan Hale. Uh, the 11th one, I think, is coming out in December, and it is called Major Impossible, and it's about John Wesley Powell. And uh, so it's that uh, they are funny, they're irreverent. Uh, the one about the Donner Party is called the Donner Dinner Party, and, uh, which I find offensive in so many ways and hilarious in so many ways. Uh, he's able to take these, these topics uh, and make them relatable to kids, make them funny, make them, th there's an impressive amount of text on each of those pages. Um, but also when it's time to treat something seriously and with respect, he's able to do that too. Um, so there's one about Harriet Tubman, but he is good at talking about the horrors of slavery and what she was trying to help people escape from. So great uh, resource there. Have you ever met him? Do you, do you know yeah, him? I, I presented him alongside him. Where did he ever come to school? We, we're tight. He comes to schools all the time. Yeah. How did you accept the honor? Uh, good question. So with graphic novels, so this year, uh, I finally had a, had a critical mass of graphic novels so that each quarter we're going to be using one. So uh, this uh, first quarter, we used three on uh, Native Americans, all written by Native Americans and illustrated by Native Americans. So uh, we did that first quarter. We're going to be coming back to one of them about Indian boarding schools later in the year. Uh, for the second quarter, we'll be using one called The Arrival. It's about immigration issues. Uh, we're using one of Nathan Hale's uh, about World War I. Uh, third quarter, that might be the end of second quarter. I should know these. Um, and then one about civil rights by Representative John Lewis um, towards the end of the year. And um, so assessment is just like any other text. Anything, if it's a true graphic novel, anything that you would use with another kind of text, you can also do with that. Um, and it, and, and so it varies for me. Uh, the arrival, the immigration one, is actually wordless. And so there's a lot of inference. There's a lot of pulling out um, 
quotes from people going through Ellis Island and um, it, with, with any of these things, you overlay primary sources on top of and look for supporting evidence and have students uh, find ways to support those arguments. And um, yeah, I, yeah, graphic novels are good. They're reading. Like even, yeah, they're reading, they're inferring, they're doing good things. Uh, last thing, I said I wouldn't use the word pinned because it's Utah women making history, so I'm promoting. Um, Better Day is 2020 upstairs. Incredible resources, and I've uh, done some work with them. Um, if you act now at this conference, they have this set of trading cards, and the trading cards are all about Utah women, so you have uh, just lots of people, all of them passed away because of rules. So um, what I would say with things like trading cards uh, is if you have them, um, also have students do something with them. And uh, Better Days 2020 has a website with resources and free resources on it. I teach US history, not Utah history, but this is part of US history. So um, when I'm talking about women's suffrage, I'm going to be using Utah examples alongside national examples and see how they fit into the national story. Uh, there are templates for having students make their own uh, trading cards after doing research so they could do things more about their own local community, they could do it about family members, they could find ways to make this more relevant to your own community and classroom and circumstances. So um, 10 bucks for this upstairs because it's normally 17 and they also have a picture book that just came out this last month that uh, is also fantastic. So I think that's all of my time. And we'll let Katie do stuff. Source, 
in and of itself, it, it means nothing. There's got to be some type of context that supports it and gives it a true meaning. Historical empathy. It's easy to, to sit here in 2019 and judge everybody you know, from hundreds of years ago. So that's a, a skill that we need to be able to kind of look at history on the terms of those that were there at the time. Historical perspective taking is, kind of falls in that, that same realm. Identifying historical significance is um, important. Not everything is worth talking about. Do we really need to cover everything up to Reconstruction? The answer is no, we don't. Um, argumentative writing. I mean, what is history all about? Everyone here presenting is pushing forward some type of argument, right? And so that if we're not doing that in the classroom, we're doing our kids a disservice. Um, sourcing, another important thing. Uh, kids need to be able to, to look at texts and kind of ask the same type of questions with each. And down below you can see this, I won't read it for you, but, but notes basically defines what texts are. And it's not just a bunch of written things, right? It's texts are photographs. They could be movies. They're graphic novels. I mean, texts, it's defined, the definition is much bigger than maybe one would think. So as kids look at different types of texts, they need to have to ask those same questions. Who, who created this? Why? What's the purpose of, of this? What biases did this person have? Those types of things. Change in continuity, that's basically like, hey, you know, things over time change, but there are also themes that stay, that they're, they're continuous, and we need to be able to help kids point those types of things out. Ethical judgment. Um, this doesn't, it kind of can contradict historical empathy, but we also, you know, we can make judgments with our 2019 mentalities that yes, slavery was atrocious, right? We can do that. That's what ethical judgment is. And we need to let kids know that that, that also was okay. It's a skill. And then analyzing documents. Um, in, in his book, he talks about photographs. We're going we're gonna to push beyond photographs today and do a little activity in a second. And then even contextualization through analogy. That, that's kind of making it relevant to the, the, you know, to today. So a lot of times we can take a historical um, topic and then compare it with what's going on today to help them better understand what was going on back then. And of course we have to be careful not to oversimplify and to those types of things. But these are all different types of skills that kids leaving history classrooms should have and be able to do in the real world. So, um, and, and some of these activities that, well, all of the activities that they just went over with you do that. And I want to do one more with you. If you take your hand out and flip it over, there is a little sheet that we're going to do right now together. And um, I'm going to have you just kind of form, let's, let's say let, this will be a group. You guys will be a group, we'll do four groups, kind of these rows here and you guys here, okay? Now there, there is a time and a place where direct instruction, you know, aka lecturing is, is important. But like these guys said, the 10 to 1 rule is, is really important too. And so as even if we're going to talk for 10 minutes, we need different types of activities that hook our kids. And this is one that I like to use. It's an artifact analysis. So, to me, one of the cool parts of history is the material culture. And it really tells you a lot about people, right? If you think of the material culture of, of our day, right? This thing right here. Can you really understand the 2019s if you don't know what one of these is, right? So, anyway, we're going to do a little artifact analysis. And I'm going to pass out a few things. And then I've, I've, got, a, I've got a bunch of stuff up here that I'm going to tell you what it is and so you can see like what kind of things you can use um, throughout different eras in history. But I'm going to pick a few things that I hopefully will stump you a little bit. So this group, and Joe, you are not involved here. This group, here's your uh, artifact. Now just go through, answer the questions. Um, for the sake of time, you can skip number one. And we've, we've already done a drawing today. Joe made you draw already. So you can skip number one, but, but uh, keep working. Let's see, this group here, give you this. So get together a little bit. I don't think anybody
anybody bites. Let's see. Get some of Take some These all have a similar theme. If you guys work with this artifact and then this group work with this. So just go through, answer these questions, and then we'll go over it real quick. Down over it, 
like this, and then you turn it, and then it holds it. Like you could be riding a horse, and this would hold your blanket on instead of you having to, and you could be hands free. So that's a blanket thing. Okay. So good job. Okay, we have. That's a replica, but those those are like colonial and fur trade era. Okay, here's your, here's the next object, and I uh, we actually have in this group a, mu a museum. Give me give me a I'm curator. Yeah, collections person. So she's a collections person, and we've stumped her. So I, I love it. So why don't you be our spokesperson? What do, what do you guys think this is? See, I was talking to you when they decided what it was. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, okay, well, what is this? Who's our spokesperson? Well, we wondered if it turned around and the other way around. Like this? Over. Okay, like this? Put the side side down. down. And oh, okay. Something to weigh like scale. scale. Oh, okay. A little scale. I need something here and here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wrong. Okay. This is a lantern hook. So pic picture of like a wall tent with a post in it. Okay. Or a little wedge tent, Civil War wedge tent or something. So here's the post. You wrap this around it. This goes here. And with the weight of the lantern, it kind of digs in. And you can see there's a little kind of hooky thing here. That digs into the wood, and that digs into the wood and keeps it pretty sturdy right there in, in your lantern. Okay? Super fun. Kind of fun. So you could use this as a lead into like a Rev War lesson or something, right? Okay, back here, what do we have? You guys better have gotten this. <laughs> Ice cream scoop. So we, we think that it is something that you they would have put a handle in the other part so you could have it extended. Put it on a fire, put your lead bits in there, melt it down, and then pour it into a mold to create your musket ball. Yep, it's called a lead ladle. Mm -hmm. And it, and it, it's per, why would I not have a handle on it? Keep it safe to base. You can keep it a. Yeah, throw, I throw it in my haversack, and I'm on the move, and when I get to camp, I carve a little stick, jam it in, and I'm good to go, right? Keep, my, keep me safe from fire. And if you haven't seen The Patriot, then you may not you know, know what this is, but yeah, you, you take your little lead toy, There's you put it in. <laughs> yep, there is. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> All right, and last group, Robert. So a, uh, we thought it might be a letter, like the letter O. This is brought to you by the letter O, or a zero. <laughs> then we thought it was an earring, but no. Then we thought it was a belt buckle, no. Um, what else can we think of? Chain link? And then what the funny side was, you couldn't see the sucker in your fingers, you got the flint. And we see the wear mark on the side. Create a fire. And you do it. Do it. Burn down the UCCC. Right? You got it. He's right. It's not a it's not a chain link. That's the classic, you know, guess. But it is a striker. And you you could see, right, when you're analyzing this text that there was some wear on one side, right? And and the way this works, any vitrified stone, so a stone that's been melted at one point in its life, will be hard enough to peel steel off of it and cause a spark. In this case, flint, that's natural in Utah. Obsidian would work, but it causes that spark, which this is kind of the first, you know, first ferro rod, you know, back in the day, flint, true flint and steel. So anyway, Again, you could use that as a, a lead into a mountain man lesson. You know, this is in the Rev War or whatever, right? So these are different activities that get kids to think as they answer questions. And then their hooks, because it's kind of a fun activity to, to maybe dive into to more of the, the content. Hey, and can I, I just say that it's also yeah. really cool how one, you can make so many inferences just from one artifact. And yeah. the cool thing about that is because there's so much archaeology in Utah, yeah. To help remind students of why archaeological artifacts are so essential and to keep them where they are, because of all the lessons we can learn just from that one thing, it's a great, great entry into that as well. Yeah, and, and that's context, right? If you if you just if you take an artifact out of its context, then it's not doesn't have as much meaning. You you see it where it is, and it makes a lot more sense. 
Absolutely. And so up here I have a bunch of different things that you can do, right? But if I would have passed this out, would you, would you guys have gotten it, what this is? What's this? Pass it around. Pass it around. Yeah, I, I, I have a cut out there, but it, here's the real, the whole brick. What is it? It's a tea brick. Right? I, I think it's really interesting. This is what they threw into the harbor at Boston. Yeah, they weren't little tea bags, right? The little white things. That, or if you're, if you're talking about the Civil War and you want to get them excited about town ball and rounders, which is what now? Baseball. You can throw around the original baseball. Right? And, and so on and so forth. What? If I would have passed this around, would you have gotten it? it is, it's a type of oyster, but it's a special kind. Nope, not abalone. Good guess, though. Wampum. It's quahog. It's a it's an oyster, but it's quahog shell, and that's what they make the wampum out of. That purple part part. So if you're if you're talking about the, you know, the first Thanksgiving and the Wampanoag um, people, then this would be a good artifact. Now. And it's the purple that was rare? Is that the Wampanoag? So they, they, would, they would take this and carve or, or create beads out of it, and then it was used to, for, to take a currency. Huh? <laughs> or you could pass something out like this to introduce your slavery union. What's this? Do, do kids realize that the t-shirt they're wearing comes from a plant? Or how painfully like monotonous it is to get those seeds out, right? So you could pass that around and let them touch and feel. Arizona cotton salad. Yeah, old bag. And then I'd make the kids spend the whole period cleaning cotton salad. Yeah, <laughs> great, great lesson. They probably need it now. pair of socks! <laughs> or if you're teaching Utah studies and, you know, What's this? A coal. Oh, a rock? Yeah. Coal, right? Anyway, I, I'm not sure we're at on time, but um, feel free to come and prove some of this stuff if you want. This is, I'll, say, I'll show you one last thing. This, this was so fascinating to me. I went to San, or to uh, St. Augustine, El Castillo de San Marcos. Do you guys know what that is? It's a fort in St. Augustine, Florida, made out of coquina, which if you look at this, this is like shell, seashell that's been cemented together over time by just through nature and they cut huge blocks out of this and made a fort of it. But if you just pat that out on their own, you, you just, you know, it's like its own little piece of cemented shell. You know? Anyway, there's, there's just a billion things that you could use. Here's a, if you're talking about, you know, the telegraph, here's what do kids think this is, right? It's a telegraph <coughs> So, thank you. Can I ask a, yeah, I got, real quick, I just got a text from my teaching partner at school. She's the literature teacher, and what's cool about her text is she sent me a picture of her classroom that she set up today. They were having a, um, a literature moment, uh, is what she called it, for, on uh, Frankenstein. Her whole classroom is set up like a lab. Like, so on one side of the room, if you want to come see it after, it's fine. But on one side of the room is all a lab. Like, it looks like a cool lab. And the kids came in and they were so excited to learn about Frankenstein. So that's another one of the hooks that you could do is just, you know, creating the environment in the classroom. So we, first of all, I, I want to thank all the fine teachers, educators on our panel. Thank you guys for bringing your ideas and activities. We have preserved about 15 minutes for Q&A. Well, 13 minutes. Um, so I don't think we need to use the mic. Can you all hear well enough about the mic? Um, and are there questions that you'd like to direct to all of them or any of the ones? Maybe we'll have them all come up here. Questions? Okay, I, I'm going to start with the first question. Oh, 
Oh, go ahead. Artifact, say something like 
a button or a pair of spectacles and then have each student examine that and present from their own perspective what this, art, what this artifact is, where did it come from, who wore this button, who, who happened to wear or use this pen and, and write a little short story about such. In, in other words, it, it's their own perspective superimposed over this artifact and what, it, what its meaning is. When, when I taught seventh yeah. grade and uh, did the Transcontinental Railroad, would they had to write something from the perspective of the Golden Spike. Uh, and, um, yeah, I did uh, it from the perspective of a piece of um, pottery that had been broken so that I could yeah. choose which, if it happened to be a Chinese worker sure. or somebody else. So it, yeah. that was, okay. yeah. I don't often do that one because it, do, it takes a lot of time for the kids to yeah.
You know, all my kids are all growing up. You know, I used to tell them all the time, I said, there are two big F in history. There's some law, because I, I love history, and I've always, you know, I kind of discussed it with my kids and whatever else like that. And, uh, about two years ago, uh, my one of my granddaughters wanted me to put on a demonstration for the public about the Civil War. So, uh, you know, we have, you'll have things from the Civil War, uh, you know, and I, and I came in dressed up as a Union soldier, I had my haversack, I had a number of items, and, you know, just the various things I pulled, pulled out of the haversack and, and put it out on the table, and they had them kind of group all around, and I got kind of a group meeting there, and everybody's kind of handling the artifacts and whatever else, and, uh, you know, they said that, I mean, the teacher's still talking about it to this day, and now she's kind of anxious for my second, her, her sister to, to get to fifth grade, so she's probably got to be back. Uh, but you know, every time I've seen that, uh, that teacher or a few other teachers that were there, you know, that, they're like, well, what? I just remember that. That was such a wonderful day. You know, it makes history come alive. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot of people in communities that may not know who do stuff like that. So reach out. Post on Facebook. <laughs> uh, so I, I used to be associated with the museum, and on occasion we, we received a lot of donations from our local folks. Some of it was really good stuff, but, but on occasion we would glean our collection. And we, you know, you can have only so many things of the same thing, and so this was always a good way to liquidate that was to try to find a school teacher that would want an extra spinning wheel to their class or a, you know, something that we'd leave at surplus out. So you may want to check with museums to see if they, if they're, uh, they have things they'd like to liquidate. Well, we've reached our time. So um, our panelists will stay around for a few minutes if you have other questions. But thanks all for attending today. Thank you.